This started out to be, um, uh, I was going to start off with a story that tells you a funny thing happened, and it's true, a funny thing did happen, um, but I'm going to say a not so funny thing happened, and that is, um, I had two incidents this week that um, really were kind of unusual. On Wednesday, and I won't give you all the boring details, but you'll get a lot of the boring details. On Wednesday, I was going to the bank downtown, and which I don't normally do. I was doing soccer stuff. And so I pulled across the street and was parked there. Went in, came out, got in my truck, just as a van pulled in beside me. Big white van, had a rack on the back that came out another three feet. And he was sitting in the van and I said to myself, self, be careful because I knew that this van was big, I couldn't see past it, I knew there was a rack on the back, I couldn't see it, and I'm in my little Chevy S10 pickup truck. So I'm backing out really slow, really slow, watching, 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 and I finally get out, and I thought, good, I cleared them, I'm safe, and all of a sudden I hear a hunk and bang. And it's like, where did that come from? I had no idea what was going on, and so I, I looked, and there was nothing back there. I looked in my little mirror, and there was a green car up against the back of me. So I pulled up, and that guy pulled up right beside me. And I thought, what happened? I had no idea what happened. And I figured we were both backing out and from across the street and bumped each other. And it's like, oh, no. Well, I, try, I, you know, I knew immediately because, I don't know, there must be some unwritten rule that whenever something happens, the other person is required to get irately mad. I don't understand that. Um, but anyhow, he gets out and he is fuming. He's probably 30 years old and scuzzy looking. And, um, but you don't judge people, I know that. Um, but I'm, I'm ad living here and I have reasons. And so I, I go up to him I, and we're across the car and I said, are you okay? And then he um, greets me with, yeah, real rough. And then he walks around. Well, my truck is a truck. There's nothing wrong with my truck. And um, he has a dent that's about this long in his back passenger door, and it's, you know, in about an inch or so. So, you know, that's unfortunate, but I, I you know, there's, you know, people die of all kinds of things. That's not one of them. And, um, and so he, uh, he starts, he just starts fuming. Look what you did in my car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, I said, don't worry, it'll take care of, we'll, we'll work all this out. And he says, well, let's not get insurance involved. He said, let's, uh, let's just um, exchange phone numbers, is what he says to me. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. And I'm thinking, it's just something about this doesn't feel right. So uh, am I up yet, Mark, on the screen things? Because I'm not seeing anything. Are you see that's all I'm getting, but, oh, you know what, I know, no, 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 not your fault, Mark. I need to turn the battery on. That, that would help. Ah, uh, there's that vibration. Sorry about that. Wonder why I kept pressing that and wasn't getting anywhere. So, um, so anyhow, he says to me, let's just change phone numbers. Let's keep the insurance companies out of this. And I'm thinking, this doesn't sound right. I have my stuff on my wallet and I'm trying to stall. And I said, well, let me, uh, let me get some stuff out of my truck. So I start to go in. The guy in the van looks at me and he goes like that called the police is what he says. I'm like, wow, that's right. So I said, so I turned to the guy and said, you know what? I think I'm just gonna call the police. He's like, oh, don't do that, man. He said, we can handle this. And I said, no, I said, if we call the police, that'll be better because that'll protect both of us. He said, don't call the police. I don't have a license. I said, I'm calling the police. <laughs> and so I turn around and start dialing the police and, and I'm telling the dispatcher because I'm probably one of the few people in the town that always has the police dispatchers memorized and it's not 911. I have that on speed dial. But, um, but I, I start telling them and the guy in the van's calling to me and it's like, what, what do you want? He just left. <laughs> so the guy left. So anyhow, officer shows, shows up and, uh, and we go through all the details. Well, it turns out the guy in the van saw everything. What the other guy had done, yes, he was backing out from across the street, but he decided he wanted to go the same direction as me, so he backed all the way across the yellow lines and then came back and hit me. I didn't know, because I couldn't see him. So the guy was guilty, didn't have a license, and I can tell you all kinds of prejudicial ideas as to why, and so uh, I won't do that. And um, so the officer did do his due stuff, and, um, 
and he drove around town, found a car, he came back, picked me up, we went down, and we took a look at that, and I said, yeah, that's the car. So it turns out he wasn't driving his own car, it was somebody else's, who's also been in a lot of trouble, and so, so they're all in trouble and all that. Well, officer shows, and I'm saying this to his praise, um, he said to me, you know, the average person in Ritman would probably say, what are you chasing a, a little dent in a hip skip like that? You know, you just spent an hour or two doing this. And he said, but when I looked at that car, there were two or three other places that were dented up. And he said, I don't want the next one to be a case where someone gets killed in the accident. And I said, all of us in Ritman appreciate that. We may not say that, but, but we do. So, um, so there were things that uh, I think there's some lessons I learned from this that I wanted to, to at least be able to teach you guys. And um, lessons for every day. Number one is always do what's right. Now I got to put that into practice today. I didn't mean to, I was driving in today and I'll make this one shorter, but as I was driving in, there's a young guy, probably 18, 20 years old, walking down the street, t-shirt and jeans. And I said to myself, it's raining, he's on a cell phone, and he doesn't look like he was out for a walk. So I tried to slow down to see if he needed help, and he basically ignored me. He looked the other way, and everywhere I was, he kept turning, so he was not looking at me. And even I said to myself, something's not right. And so uh, I drove down the road just about a quarter of a mile, and I found an abandoned car embedded in a ditch after taking down some signs. So once again, I got to use the magic of the dispatcher and, and, uh, and put some of Rob Gable's people to work for the day. So anyhow, always, if, you, if you find yourself in that situation, call the police. Just call the police. Even if you're wrong, call the police. It always works out better that way. So that's a, a life lesson you can all go home with today. And then the other thing is don't trust anyone. <laughs> you know, I, my first reaction to that guy was he's obviously in financial difficulty. And I thought, you know, I want to help him. And yeah, you know, we'll, we'll help work this out and we'll make sure he's okay. But I, I should have known that there was more to it. Well, that was all free. That wasn't anything I was intending to, when I first wrote all this up, I didn't have that in there. Um, here's a story I did have uh, written up originally. Edith, uh, Edith is from Darling, Darlington, Maryland. She's a mother of eight children. That makes her a hero right there, doesn't it? Uh, Edith has eight children, and one day she came home. I don't know where she was at, store or something, and she came home, and five of the children were in a circle on the floor, just laughing and giggling and having a good time playing. And of course, that always thrills a mother's heart. So Edith came over, she was all excited, and was uh, really pleased to see the kids playing so well together. And she looked over their shoulders and she screamed. She screamed, children, run! And they all did. But first, they all picked up a baby skunk and then ran, trying to figure out why. <laughs> well, a um, little bit on the unusual circumstance for Edith that day. Sometimes we feel that way. You know, there's things that happen in our lives and, and you know there's trouble, but you're gonna grab the skunk before you take off and you actually take it with you. I was so glad we sang the songs because they know what they're doing when they select those. But you know, oh God, our help in ages past. Isn't that a great reminder that God has helped us in the past and he's very present today. Great is his faithfulness. He's always there to, to help us. Even when we're not faithful to him, he's always faithfully helping us. He is our rock. He's our mighty fortress. He is so strong, and he wants to be a part of our lives. And you and I, on occasion, bump fenders and pick up skunks and run. And, um, and yet God is very, very much there. Nehemiah uh, was in that circumstance. Last week, if you were here, we talked about facing discouragement and that's tough, that's a tough thing to have to do. And Nehemiah was facing discouragement. If you remember, I said it's sort of like uh, running a race and then at the very end you find out there's an incline that you weren't expecting and, and you've already run miles and not only are you running up this final hill, it's raining and it's slick and people are rolling barrels at you and throwing volleyballs and things trying to stop you. It can be so discouraging. Well, this week it's facing conspiracy. 
So it gets even worse, and I don't even know what to have people shooting at us and throwing at us at this point. Nehemiah had no idea how complicated life was about to get, but it did. First, when he started this whole project of building a wall around Jerusalem, he was facing sarcasm. Then he was facing some mockery of people who just uh, thought it was a joke what he was doing. Um, there was opposition, criticism, and now finally they're conspiring, conspiring against him to, uh, to bring um, an end to the task. And the initial attack, which we looked at last week, was a little bit psychological, but now comes some physical encounters. And as he was shouting to all his people, keep building, each one was grabbing their skunk and running and saying, we're in trouble. While they were trying to solve the problem, it got worse right before their eyes, just like Edith did, just like Nehemiah. Read, I read twice this last couple weeks a story from different sources, the same thing from the life of Thomas Edison. So I thought, and it's a great story, so I thought I would share some of this. All of us know Thomas Edison. He was kind of involved in inventing the microphone, which we use, the phonograph, although we don't have that. We use CDs and stuff, the incandescent lights and uh, storage batteries, which we have in our uh, our building here, lots of talking movies, although that's not what these are, but it's a branch of that. Um, he had over 1,000 inventions that are all patented. In December of 1914, it was a freezing cold day, and Edison was working on some projects that were really um, important to him and was just not getting it. It wasn't happening. And so he was expending a lot of finances trying to do, uh, do things, and it just wasn't working. Well, that evening, uh, all of a sudden came the horrible cry from, uh, from his laboratory area. Somebody discovered and shouted the word fire. And we all know that's not a fun thing to hear. Within minutes, all his packing compounds and the records of everything that he had done, all the goods and materials that he had, that he was working on, everything was going up in flames. It took eight different fire departments to come and put it out. The heat was just so intense that they couldn't hardly get near it. The water pressure was low and everything ended up being destroyed. And Thomas Edison was 67 years old at the time and his son was greatly concerned about how he was going to handle it. So his son started looking around to see, where's dad, where's dad? And when he found him, he found dad frantically moving around. And dad turns him and he says, where's mom? Go get her, son, and tell her to bring all her friends because they'll never see a fire like this again. <laughs> That's pretty amazing attitude. The next day, he got all his uh, employees together, a lot of scientists and people who did work for him, and everybody expected a depressed Thomas Edison, and everybody expected him to, uh, to graciously disband all the work and the workers. But they were kind of surprised when the first thing he said was, we're rebuilding. <laughs> and then he went on to say to them, lease all the machine shops in town. Obtain a wrecking crane from the Erie Railroad Company. And then he added, oh, by the way, does anybody know where we can get some money? <laughs> he refused to be defeated by discouragement. Nehemiah was someone who had seen and faced an awful lot of discouragement in his time. Here's some of the sources. We looked at verse, um, we read some of these passages, and, and I would say the first source of his discouragement is the same thing for you. It's people. People. People were the source of his discouragement. And the Bible is very clear in telling us who. Sam Ballot, a bad guy. Dave Jensen's not here, so we don't need a boo today. Um, Tobiah. Um, you know, these guys were directly opposed to what, Nehemiah wanted to do. They were probably even more than that. Although it was people that was bothering Nehemiah, probably they didn't care a whole lot about Nehemiah. It could have been anybody doing this project. They were really opposed to God. They were opposed to God, 
and they were fighting everything that he did, but people were the ones who caused the problem. And then in this case, it was threats. So, but for you and I, we can add circumstances that um, these bring just frustrations and discouragements to us. Here in, in their case, uh, the plan that we read was that they were going to attack from all around the city. As we're building these walls just all around, they're going to attack uh, the Ammonites and the Arabs and all these people are going to come from the outside and attack all the way around. This was the equivalent in our day of what we would call terrorism. They had plans that they were going to wipe out this whole thing in Jerusalem. The scriptures tell us they were warned 10 times. I don't know if that's just, you know, a thing of speech that just, you know, tells us that over and over again they were warned, but many times they were warned and they heard rumors all the time about, oh, you guys better watch out. You better watch what you're doing on that wall because I heard the Ammonites are going to do this. Oh, I heard the Arabs are getting ready to come and do this. And, and the rumors were flying like crazy. It was just a matter of time until the attack was going to happen. We don't know when these attacks began, but we do know that the entire process of building the wall took 52 days. That's what it tells us in chapter 6, verse 15, and we'll see that at a later time. So I'm going to guess probably somewhere about four weeks into the project. They've been out there, they're organized, they're working day and night, working hard, and for four weeks they're, they're going basically without rest, without any kind of um, support, and they're building up these walls, and then now all of a sudden comes all the rumors and all the hatred toward them, all the threats, and it's really going to be pretty bad. If you are someone who is prone to discouragement, you get discouraged easily, then here's a piece of advice. You can't risk spending time with people who traffic in discouraging comments and information. <laughs> you can't afford it. You can't do that. If you're somebody who gets beat down real easily, uh, you get upset or disturbed at some of the negative things that you hear, then don't dwell in that world. Don't be with them. Don't do it all the time, but I saw a little bit of a show last night that was on TV. I rarely watch TV kind of movies, and, and it was just, it was okay. I mean, it wasn't bad, but I don't see these that often, and it had, uh, there was a marital breakup and all that kind of stuff in it, and it just, it was just bummed me out. You know, I just, I see enough of that. I don't need to do that. And even had dreams about it. So, you know, you don't need to dwell on that kind of thing if that's hard for you to do. So just don't do it. Of course, Nehemiah responded and said to the people of Israel, but this was interesting. In verse 9, did you see what it said? It said that they prayed. We prayed. Before this, all the time, Nehemiah was the one who was constantly going to prayer. He was consistent in that. He was always praying about what was going on. And now, all of a sudden, the people got it. So the attacks are coming verbally that pretty soon there's going to be military attacks on them. And the first thing that they all decide to do is let's pray. We need to pray about this. So they prayed, of course, to God. That's pretty exciting for Nehemiah, I'm sure, to, to see that the people are getting it. <clears throat> uh, we don't know that Nehemiah, you know, he might have stood up and said, hey, everybody, we need to pray, and they all agreed, or, we, or they might have just gone to it. But whatever it was, uh, they did two things. They prayed, and they set guards out to, uh, to be sure that they were okay. Well, there's things that will cause discouragements for you and I. And um, some of these I think I have in your, your outline for you to follow. But, um, you know, these people have been working, and I'm going to say at least four weeks or right around there. There's been no coffee breaks, uh, no days off. No one got to take a weekend away. Um, and now is a very, very real threat of a military attack. Now, we don't normally experience that kind of thing, but about seven years ago almost, our country saw something like that, and we all remember, uh, if we're able to, 
we'll all remember just the, the emotions and the feelings that we had over something that in comparison was probably not nearly as, as dangerous to us individually. Someone had to stay in guard and some had to work to get this job done and some of them probably ended up doing double shifts. Everything becomes magnified when you're tired, exhausted, and under pressure. All those little piles of dirt, which maybe are just a, a foot or two high, all of a sudden seem like mountains to them. And things just look bigger and a lot worse. Well, a lot of things happen that can cause discouragement. One would be a loss of strength. In verse 10, we see that they were focused there on the, on the rubbish. Uh, well, let me go back and say that in verse 10, uh, under strength, that they were, it says they were giving out. My translation says they were giving out. It literally means that they were, they were failing. They were tottering. They were staggering. Uh, they're falling over. Uh, it's just difficult for them to go on. They're losing strength. They were very exhausted and tired. And another thing that can cause discouragement is that um, you will lose vision. They lost their vision. That's where they focused on, on, the, on the rubbish that was there. And, and rubbish literally means the, the dry earth or the debris. Um, they focused on the fact that there was rubble and debris and dry ground and and stuff that was in the way. What they were doing originally is say, boy, we gotta move all this stuff and build a wall. Now all of a sudden to move all this stuff was just bigger than what they could imagine. They lost vision of the finished wall and they were now focused on all the obstacles that were laying in their way. And then they had a loss of confidence. They lost their confidence. They said in verse 10, we cannot rebuild. We cannot rebuild. Wow. If it were four weeks earlier, four weeks earlier, they were gun ho ready to go. It's like, yeah, we can do this. Great plan. We're all going to take a section of the wall. We're responsible for from here to here. We can do that. We can do that. That'll work. They all thought they could do this and get it done. Now, all of a sudden, all the obstacles, all the discouragement, all the tiredness, the weariness, and now they can't do it. When you lose your strength, you lose vision. When you lose your vision, you lose confidence. And that leads to a loss of security. You can't, uh, they don't feel secure anymore. They feel helpless. They feel as though they're in danger. They were told that the attacks are gonna happen so suddenly and so thoroughly that for the most part, they won't even know it'll happen. In other words, they're going to be killed before they realize what hit them. Now, that's frightening. That's a frightening way to live. And uh, they, they lost all their security. What would you do if you were them? You know what some of them did? Some of them ran away. Some of them ran away. And probably more than likely, those who were coming from the nearby towns outside, remember a couple weeks ago when we showed you the maps and and stuff. Some of them were coming from outside of Jerusalem, but they always did business in Jerusalem. They had responsibilities for certain segments of the wall. Probably some of them said, what are we in for this for? There's no reason for us to put our lives on the line. I, I doubt that too many of them who lived there and their families would have been wiped out had they abandoned them. I don't think they did much of that, but probably some of them from outside did. Would you run away in that situation? Some did. Maybe even uh, because of it, there might have been less workers to do. At, at first, we had this huge task, but at least we had a workforce. Now we've lost some of that. Some of them have abandoned us. Do you think that only the godless people face discouragement? <laughs> do you think that um, it's possible for someone to have a right heart and, and be doing what God wants them to do, but also have obstacles that maybe at times just seems a bit overwhelming. I, I think that's possible. I think it's possible for people uh, to be discouraged to a degree. Uh, we're not defeated, but we can be discouraged. I wrote this, it probably makes no sense, but 
it sounded cute to me. I said, sometimes, at the darkest times, you're just outside of the greatest of times. Um, you know, sometimes when it gets really, really bad, really, really bad, and it feels as if there's no way out, sometimes you may be just inches away from where God wants you to be, where it breaks into sunlight and openness and, and victory. It's just very possible that we could, could be there. So uh, it, it takes you back to Winston Churchill's famous speech of never give up, never give up, because we don't know how close we are to breaking through. I do know this, here with Nehemiah and those builders, only the totally committed were the ones who risked completing this task. It was too dangerous, your life was on the line, and unless you were totally and absolutely committed, you were not about to risk your life, but they did. Well, how can, um, how can they deal with this? There's a new strategy, you can't ignore uh, can't ignore what's going on. You can't ignore the, um, the threats. It would be like driving down the street with a flat tire and pretending it doesn't exist. Uh, you got to do something. Well, the first thing they needed to do in verse 13, we see them do this, is to go back to your original goal. What are we doing? Why are we doing this? What's the purpose? What keeps us going? They became focused on the protection of all. They knew that we had to get this done because we are all in danger. We have to do this work. Everyone's needed. Everyone needs to be protected. We have to do this. It was a hard decision, I'm sure, by Nehemiah because here he specifically is telling them you have to get everybody involved. I, I would imagine there were probably some older people uh, maybe like me, who, who maybe didn't do so much on the original starting of the wall, that all of a sudden they're saying, you know, bud, you got to get in there. We need you to help. We need you to be building. We need you to at least hold a spear and protect us or do something. Uh, there might have been some younger children that got pulled in that mom and dad always said, oh, they're too young. They shouldn't be there. Now all of a sudden they're being pulled in. Had to be an incredible decision for Nehemiah to say we have to put our families in harm's way, but we need to do this. It's the only way to survive and to rebuild the wall. There was other ways they could have survived. They could have ran. They could have fleed. They could have gone anywhere else they, they could find refuge. They could have done that and survive, but they could never survive and rebuild the wall unless absolutely everybody was involved, and that was their original goal. That's what they wanted to do. They also needed to direct their attention to the Lord. Isn't it wonderful in verse 14 when Nehemiah just starts, you know, rattling off who God is. God is awesome. God is great. We need to be reminded of that from time to time. Sometimes, you know, the obstacles are so big and so strong in front of us that we fail to remember that God is even greater than that. God is even a lot greater than that. The, the obstacles are true and they're real and, and all the things that can go wrong can go wrong. And pain is pain and it hurts and, and difficulty is difficult and it does bother us. But God is still God and he's on the throne. They were looking at the rubbish possibly looking at the enemies, they needed to look at the Lord. Nehemiah somehow looked at them and could see the fear on their faces. So he tried to start off by remembering what God had done. And Nehemiah had memories of what God had done. Remember, it was not real long ago that Nehemiah, maybe just five, six months ago, when he first heard the report of how bad it was in Jerusalem, and he started praying and fasting. And then God just kept leading him and pouring a burden into his heart. And finally, Nehemiah was able to openly talk to the king, who was the king to put a halt originally to the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And then now um, he has issued all the support and, and, and help that he could give to them. So Nehemiah had all these memories, and he's reflecting on who God is, his attributes, how awesome he is. He's thinking of the greatness of God, and he's marveling, and as that happens, they become refreshed and renewed in their commitment. 
usually when we're defeated or discouraged, we're usually thinking about one thing, and that's ourselves. That's all we're thinking about is ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> that's true in most cases. When you're discouraged, when you're defeated, uh, when you're sad, uh, when you're hurting, uh, those things are all legitimate. We all go through that, but a lot of times we're more focused on ourselves than, than other things. If we can just stay focused on Christ and, and on what he has for us. It appeared to them as though uh, everything they had worked for, everything they had prayed for was about to crash down. They had every reason to be discouraged, but um, they needed to balance their thoughts and their actions. They needed to keep everything in perspective and, um, and they needed to go on. Prayer and hard work got them where they were and they needed to continue to do that. Nehemiah called them back to action. He called them back to doing the work. Remember we've been suggesting the last few weeks that um, you can't just pray. You can't just say, well, you know, I'll, I'll be in the room, I'll pray, maybe the wall will get built. <laughs> and you don't want to, you don't dare just go out and start building the wall and then think later, I, I'll pray about it. Uh, but we need to do all of that together. And that's what they did. They went back together. And in verse 16, we'll look at these a little bit more uh, in the next couple of weeks, but um, in verse 16, we're going to find out that they did even more. They had to draw their swords. They actually had to become uh, soldiers of a sense, at centuries to, to guard and, and to watch. And they were, um, they were gonna be prepared to defend in the event that that was needed. Somehow Nehemiah got some intelligence, you'll see this coming up soon, that told him that uh, they were about to be attacked. And so they prepared their ways to get ready. They were hearing all the rumors um, most of us believe that that, in, that that fact got back to the enemies that heard that, oh no, uh, Israel is preparing themselves, they're ready to fight back. And so for whatever reason there is, uh, this attack never occurs. It doesn't happen. Um, God used counter information and allowed them to, to um, avoid a conflict. It would have been wrong if uh, Nehemiah and the, and the Israelites had done nothing. It would have been wrong. They would have got wiped out. They had to do something. Um, it's really wrong to do nothing but fight. <laughs> if all they did was, okay, we're not gonna build, we're not gonna pray, but let's just go out and fight them. That would have been wrong as well in that instance. Uh, but we need to seek God, find out his purposes, and, and his desires and follow him as much as we possibly can. Here's a couple lessons just to try to remember as we think through this, uh, what these people are through. It's more difficult to finish than to start. Everybody here knows that's true. <laughs> it, it's it, the opposite way of saying that. It's, it's easier to start a project than it is to finish one. We all get very excited about things. We want to do them. It's going to be fun. It's going to be great. Uh, but then as time goes on, the details come. We start to lose momentum. We lose sight of the goal. We grow weary. And in their case, and as well as in your case, sometimes Satan delights in the incompleted task. He loves it when you start to do something and you never get it done. I remember when I was in high school, I remember going to a youth event where the speaker made a reference, and I probably didn't hear very much in this event, but I remember the speaker saying something about, he was talking in prophecy, and he made an, oh, by the way, the book of Revelation is really hard to understand. Not too many people really understand the book of Revelation. That's what he said. So I, I of course, did the right thing. I went home, and I got a notebook out, and I said to myself, I'm going to read the book of Revelation and write down what it's all about so people can understand it. <laughs> nice, nice idea. And I got into it, you know, some depth into it, maybe uh, a chapter or so, and finally decided I can't understand this to do it. So there's a task somewhere sitting out there in a, 
uh, archaeological find somewhere is my initial notes on the book of Revelation that never got finished. And so now I've done other stuff since then, but that was kind of silly. But, you know, my heart was right. I was going to help everybody in the world. Everybody was going to understand the book of Revelation because I was going to write about it. But I didn't get very far. And so often that happens to us that we just, you know, we want to do stuff, but, and there's sometimes good reasons and right reasons. I'm okay with starting a project and finding that there's something more essential to do. That's okay too. But um, it's so hard at times to finish what even God has called us to do. And another thing that we learn is that fatigue can cause paranoia. Now, um, in case you don't know, but paranoia is basically that concept that uh, everything and everyone is against us. It brings a lot of fear, uh, a lot of insecurity. Uh, it, there's uncertainty. And sometimes the fatigue will do that to us. In the world of sports, the game is usually won or often won or lost not because of skills, because when you get to professional level or even on equal levels, a lot of times the skills are the same, but it's the mental attitude that's going to win or lose certain games. As believers, as Christians who know Christ and we have uh, the, the tools and resources that he's given to us, we need to try hard to, um, to go above the circumstances. Nehemiah and the people of Israel went to prayer. And they went to prayer because of their trust in God. They knew God. They knew he was great. They knew he was awesome. They knew he was involved. They knew he was powerful and wise, but they knew he cared. They knew he had a plan. And they went to him because they trusted him. And as a result, in trusting him and going to him and knowing about him and learning and, and doing all the right things, they were able to overcome some of the circumstances. Not everything turns out as good as what this does, but trusting God is still always the right choice. Let's go to prayer together. God, we want to just thank you for your word and for the examples of people's lives who have been there, done that, and who have lived in a way that demonstrates to us a real uh, trust in you. God, we want to do that too. We want to trust you with our hearts and our lives and uh, we want to have uh, a peace and a relationship with you. And we know that only comes through Jesus Christ and through what he did on the cross. And by us uh, just recognizing that his gift for sin is for our sin as well. And then when he died on the cross and paid for sins, that that was for our sins. And that the only forgiveness, the only peace... The only way to, to have you and your grace is through Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for that gift and for the victory that he won when he walked out of the grave because we are assured, based on your word, that we too can live. Thank you so much. We want to have eternity with you, but we also want you in our lives today. And you promise to be with us. You never leave us. You don't forsake us. Uh, you are that fortress, the rock, the ever-present help in our time of need. And we're so grateful for that. Help us to be dependent upon you. Help us to trust you. Help us to live for you. Help us to do what you want us to do. We just open our hearts and ask you to search us today. In Christ's name, amen.